Welcome everyone to uh, the next uh, in the series uh, building blocks for for tax. Uh, we're very privileged to have uh, Dirk von Oenig and uh, Laura Plummer uh, um, from uh, 4Q in our midst. Uh, there, together with uh, Daniel and myself uh, from from DPA, presenting uh, the three times three times three concept, or uh, as we call it, the structured and automated process for anything of in the company service charges whether it's called headquarters shared service center or other bu service hub uh, charges be, which are being uh, cross-charged within a multinational um today's session uh, will will consist of a first introduction on where we started the standardization of these in the company charges through the three times three times three concepts i will explain and then Derek and Laura will uh, take it away on explaining the uh, fully loaded automated process uh, for Q uh, is is offering to the market, uh, and and they will will give their background uh, at uh, at that point in time. Um, um, I I would like to invite maybe Derek uh, to do a short introduction of himself right now. Is that okay, Derek? Of course, yes. Thank you, uh, Steve. Much, much appreciated, and thank you for uh, for having us. Um, my name is uh, Dirk van Unnik, or Dirk van Unnik in English, <laughs> I suppose. Um, I'm the uh, VP of Tax Development at uh, at 4Q. Um, I with me Laura Plummer, um, Tax Automation, um, and May Ma, uh, our VP of Transformation. Um, 4Q is a company that is uh, rooted in in General Electric, um, GE. Uh, we became an independent company in October 2019, and uh, we're the owners of a um, automation program that started about 10 years ago inside of GE, um, and which we've now continued as an independent company. Um, we started back in October with about 40 people. We're about 90 people right now, uh, mostly in the US, but also in, in Europe, where we are seated, and uh, in other places around the world. Um, can we go to page one, please, Critica? The yes. next page. Uh, before I hand over back to Steve again, uh, what I have on this page is kind of an, a general overview of end-to-end um, -end processes for intercompany services. So if you look at the top, uh, you first determine the charges. So then you say, okay, what, what is we charging for? How much, where from, and where to? Uh, which is the part that Steve will talk about in a second. Um, and then the part that where we come in with with 4Q and one biller is uh, the actual invoicing, um, accounting entries, um, leading to analysis, the profitability, and the VAT leakage, for example, which in turn leads to reports that we produce, which can help in turn the planning and corrections, and um, that tax management in in the company may be uh, may be doing, which is the part that uh, tax where tax management comes in. Um, so if you look at the automation of that, the first part talks about the inputs, if you like, uh, that Steve will talk about in a second uh, on three by three by three. And the automation of the next two arrows is uh, what Laura, uh, May and I will talk about um, in, in the pages thereafter. Steve, can I hand over to you for the next page? Yes, uh, certainly. Uh, the next page uh, talks a little bit about the Three times three times three. So, what what are we meaning with those uh, mysterious uh, uh, three times three references? Uh, as you see in this slide, it's a global headquarter which uh, on charges to, uh, like a, a, a typical surface charge waterfall principle charges on to business platforms at the same time. Uh, hits also uh, regional shared service centers, uh, so you get different transactions within the group. Uh, it's it's pretty clear different uh, multinationals use different definitions of uh, what what activities do fall in their headquarters versus a business uh, BU service hub or a shared service center. Um, I think that that is uh, a given. So it, it's not like there's uh, consistent definitions of what uh, type of activities do fall under headquarters, shared service centers, or BU service hubs. So that gives you the first three. There's three different types of in the company services which are 
uh, part of this normalized or standardized approach. It, um, it, it deals with three territories uh, in, in, uh, and therefore is, is a, a universal global approach to looking at end company services uh, and not only for one territory. And it also has a very defined role of group companies. Uh, group companies are, are either a contract service provider, uh, they could also act as a lead service provider, and, and obviously some are only going to be a service recipient. Uh, that that has the uh, um, this this approach does drive a high degree of standardization, where every company can define the three types, the three territories on which in each territory the 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 uplift on cost uh, based on on a, a universal benchmark so a benchmark for the americas and latin a benchmark for EMEA region as well as for asia does allow you to uplift uh, where the cost originate typically that's where the people are, who provide the service are on the payroll uh, do uplift uh, those costs with, uh, say, 5% profit uh, margin. So that that even more defines a, a standardized approach to uh, to these services, where, uh, for example, the, the contract service provider, that's where the cost uh, originate, uh, will uplift, say, 100 with uh, 5% and charge one, uh, 105 to the lead service provider. Uh, lead lead uh, a service provider will add 20 of its own cost plus 5% and the total package will, through allocation keys, be uh, shared with the service recipients. What we see in today's world is uh, that, that different entities take uh, uh, a multitude of roles. Uh, so the, the world has become more and more virtual. It's not always clear, clear the shared service center is only in Poland or in India. It's also not always clear where the business the BU service hubs are located. That adds to the complexity of uh, what we're looking at here. An additional um, uh, question you, you run into here, can you run this model as a multiple party service contract? So can you do a virtual netting and pooling of services? That, that basically means you're, you're considering uh, everyone is providing a service and everyone is receiving a service and rather than putting a lead service provider in the middle uh, you basically do a virtual settlement and pooling of services including the invoices and the charges and, and the cash stream re related to it. Uh, this is this is sort of the big picture uh, where a lot of companies are uh, taking this uh, to the next level. They try to get away from spreadsheet uh, and, and especially because the, the because of the increased complexities with, but also they're afraid of, uh, of human errors more and more given this uh, this especially this virtual version I, would, I was just referring to. Um, some companies say, okay, we have a good working relationship between in-house tax, uh, IT, and uh, the, the finance department. And because we have a good working relationship, we can actually uh, push a lot of the, the, the collection of the costs uh, from where the transaction generates data points to the, uh, to the cost centers where costs are being collected for HR, global, HQ services, or whatever label you give to the cost centers uh, and and because we can we have a good working re relationship with IT and uh, finance they can build a model which is already fully automating that um, a few of my clients have, have fully implemented the model within their SAP system where where the, the three groups were working together very very efficiently and that meant the the, the whole uh, process was was built in-house um, uh, obviously if you don't have that luxury uh, or or IT and finance are already uh, filled to the to, to the max uh, and and in some cases because 
uh, the, 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 the 4Q, as, as Dirk and Laura will, uh, will tell you later, has a lot of additional uh, intelligent features uh, from the, the legacy of GE to, uh, to uh, rely on. Uh, it, it could be better to, to run that in a separate software package uh, called, uh, called 4Q. So that's, that's a little bit uh, setting the scene. If we take it to the next slide, uh, again, you see the charges determination, the actual invoice, the analysis, and the planning and correction um, of uh, of those uh, of those costs and invoices. So uh, the assumptions on this table, uh, this is a uh, an anonymized version that we have. Yeah, so we, we've built in a few polls so uh, the attendees can uh, uh, answer uh, if, if they would like to participate, please do. Uh, how do you collect your data now on these service charges? Do you use Excel spreadsheets uh, and is tax in the lead or is finance? Do you already use uh, robotics or it, is there currently not a structure? So please go ahead and uh, click your, uh, your real situation uh, now, then we can in a few minutes, we a uh, few moments, we can see the result of uh, of the audience we have today. Yeah, cost uh, the, the collection of cost is one of the the hardest part, and uh, certainly if uh, five years down the road you try to find out what costs were uh, coming from where, it's always a a complete nightmare, and you are typically have to go to, into the basement where old files are, the basement, sometimes a virtual basement uh, where all that information is, is hiding. Um, less and less, um, uh, that's, that's the way to do it. Do we have the, the results already? One point of attention in collecting uh, the, this, the, these expenses is obviously the, the whole digitization of, uh, of uh, also how the tax authorities look at these uh, spreadsheets uh, from the past, especially Excel approaches, uh, which happen once a year. Um, tax authorities, we, we just had a session on the new uh, guidelines, TP guidelines uh, Germany presented, and it's very clear they want much more contempor contemporaneous documentation and updated information around data, including uh, where uh, the data around intercompany charges, and not only um, uh, looking at contemporaneous documentation whenever there's a unique transaction, so also the regular transactions like uh, headquarter charges in the German um, uh, practice, transfer pricing practice becomes more and more a uh, contemporaneous type of exercise. Okay, so we, we see even split uh, tax department is doing some of this finance work, but also finance is uh, on, the, on, on almost 50%. And already a, uh, about 10% is, is moving to robotics. Uh, I, I think that, uh, that makes sense, but it's still, it still looks like a lot of manual work is, uh, is being done. Uh, Derek, any observations on this? It, it's what we kind of expected. Um, a lot of it is still uh, Excel based. And to your earlier point, um, the ability to show data behind the actual charges made um, is, is hard, of course, when, when it's in Excel. Um, and that makes, makes it in turn hard, perhaps, to explain to tax authorities. So this question is, uh, how, how do you uh, organize your in the company invoices. Uh, you can have the spreadsheet, but ultimately, someone, one legal entity, has to charge a, a, in, uh, a, a issue an invoice to one of the other group companies. How is that currently done? Is that uh, typically something uh, tax department picks up uh, following the spreadsheet one by one, or is that uh, spreadsheet handed back to finance, who's then organizing the the billing? Or is it fully uh, automated and we, we made two versions, central cost uh, uh, to invoice conversion or decentralized? Uh, decentralized uh, decentralized is, is if you have one point, you bring all the costs 
uh, to, and then that lead service provider, as I explained before, charges it to uh, to all the beneficiaries. Uh, the fully automated decentralized cost is obviously if, if each and every provider is also a recipient, uh, and you you move more towards this virtual uh, headquarters, shared service center, and BU service hub uh, configuration, which means everyone's in is invoicing everyone. Typically, CFOs don't like it because there's a lot of invoices, but they don't mind if, as long as those invoices are fully automated and follow uh, an economic logic, i.e. Uh, do uh, the appropriate collection of costs and the, 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 and apply the relevant uplifts and allocation keys uh, to meet also the the benefit test, uh, which is always waiting on the other side uh, at the level of the service recipient. Derek, any uh, any observation from your uh, experience uh, on how these invoices uh, currently are are being handled very often manual um, simply because um, the data collection is already manual and the transformation to an actual invoice in the actual bookings uh, almost by necessity goes um, uh, manual as well uh, with, with the challenges of making sure that you have the right indirect tax treatment um, but that, that is my expectation but hopefully uh, I, I'll be uh, I, I'll be surprised here Okay, this at, at, at least is in line with what what I've seen that tax does the spreadsheet but doesn't necessarily generate the invoices, although there's still some percentage who's actually doing it. Here actually the uh, percentage of uh, fully automation central cost to invoice conversion is, uh, is definitely there. The fully automated where everyone charges everyone and therefore creates a lot of intercompany invoices. But since it's all automated, uh, it, it might reflect better the economic reality, uh, the virtual reality we uh, tend to live in uh, these days due to COVID-19. Um, that's still on zero uh, as, as expected, but certainly automation will allow you to do so. Uh, th this is sort of an, uh, a, a next thing which we are interested in, how many of the uh, steps uh, have been uh, automated in in your organization? And uh, steps A or is, is uh, especially where does the data come from? So the, the data after a transaction gets books in, the, in your general ledger, then it gets forwarded to call center and from that maybe gets aggregated into uh, more functionally specific cost centers. Um, how many of those steps of data collection have been automated in your organization? Is it less than two, less than four, or less than six? So that the whole process of collecting data and and on charging the uh, the uh, sorry, collecting the data for the charges and then uh, the, having the cumulative cost allocated and sent through invoices to the uh, ultimate uh, beneficiaries. Okay, so so most people are uh, do have a few steps already automated, uh, but not yet the whole process. And the whole process just to uh, recall, there's there's source data, HR and finance with an uplift, which defines then the type of cost, uh, which gets aggregated into a cost center, which gets allocated to the ultimate beneficiaries. The calculations are made, which is the typical Excel spreadsheet a lot of people uh, are still uh, relying on. That creates a data feed to an invoice module. The invoice module needs uh, tax uh, information like uh, a VAT uh, number, a VAT code, but also needs to be validated against an invoice module. Uh, so what is the legal agreement and what does the legal agreement say? Does it say cost plus five or not? And all of that leads to a, uh, uh, through the invoice module to a feedback uh, into an ERP system like SAP where the invoice ultimately is being created. While these steps all 
come with a degree of automation. So welcome everyone. My name is Laura Plummer and uh, I came to 4 q uh, through um, my work as a tax automation specialist. So I mostly work with um, integrations for systems from an indirect tax perspective. Um, we had actually done quite a big integration with uh, 4Q's systems prior to them leaving General Electric. Uh, but what we are gonna focus on here in this slide and the next slide are sort of the general processes that we walk through um, and even from a, a general technical perspective on uh, how we process transactions in our system. Currently, we have a, a module called One Biller. This is part of our platform. There are several different modules in the platform itself, but this platform in particular is of interest because this is really um, our intercompany billing process. So what it does is it has the ability to integrate with uh, any number of systems, um, SAP, Oracle, uh, any of the major um, ERP systems, uh, as well as other general ledger uh, uh, instances to enable information um, that the client may want to pass into the system and have processed. Um, that integration is uh, completed uh, in conjunction with our service team. We have quite a large operations team that functions uh, to participate in that. We're flexible enough that we are able to reproduce uh, and standardize uh, any of the accounting information uh, that's required along with the types of services that are generally uh, transacted through the system. Um, our system is really configurable at multiple levels, which includes the ability to validate information that comes into the system, um, process data at different levels, including uh, country, uh, legal entity, and also P&L level. Um, and with that information, uh, we're able to produce uh, compliant invoicing in 93 countries. All the rules uh, that exist in our system um, at the country level are maintained uh, in our application uh, by our team. And we are able to calculate uh, all the different types of taxes that are required, including indirect withholding and, and, and a variety of others. Um, then, we are able to generate the compliant invoices. We also have in countries where it's appropriate uh, e-invoicing, FAST, and some of the other functionalities available in order to be compliant in specific uh, regions of the world. Um, that information uh, is also collected within our system. So we enable reporting um in a variety of ways uh and access points for tax and finance folks um what's also good is we have uh output files for both ar and ap in case you would want to integrate with uh, a local general ledger um we can also facilitate uh the ability to settle into various settlement systems um, and then uh, also, if warranted, assist in generating invoices through the ERPs themselves. So basically, our system in, interacts with the ERPs. Uh, uh, we find uh, with GE and some of our other large clients that we have encountered, you know, 40 or 50 ERPs that we then integrate with across. Um, all the different uh, levels of business. Um, this gives us uh, a variety of advantages. We're able to adapt to however each business 
um, uh, processes on a daily basis for their other transactions. Um, and then we can fold into uh, their existing compliance process. Um, Dirk, maybe you can talk a little bit about the tax advantages of, of the system here as well. Absolutely. Um, the, the middle box in, in blue here, the, the processors, what, what they really do, and I'll talk about the three different types of automation that, we, uh, that we've uh, created. And what they really do is automate and first assign what we call a service type and then say, okay, based on that service type, the service category, whether it's legal services or financial services or anything else, uh, the system automatically um, produces the right VAT treatment or indirect tax treatment in general in, in 90 plus countries, as well as the invoices. So there's no manual allocation there. There's no manual decision on what the appropriate uh, decision is. And that's, that's fully automated, um, which provides for transparency and consistency um, and efficiency, of course, in, in terms of that determination. Um, at the same time, um, where appropriate, the markups are applied as well. Um, and that basically relates to a, a table that can be pre-filled by the, uh, by the um, client themselves as they see it appropriate um, with markups to apply on those, uh, on those services costs. Um, and those two together go on the invoice. So the invoice production is there, which is available for either upload to the tax authorities um, in, in terms of a tax return or in real-time compliance where, where that is applicable. Uh, but at the same time, it also feeds into uh, reports because the importance of our process, as you see it here, is that uh, one biller is itself producing and processing the data. Um, and we'll have all the data in terms of markups and, and uh, indirect tax treatment, but also the composition of those uh, charges, what costs are being uh, charged out, um, and then line by line, we'll, we'll be able to the recipient of the charge, what the costs were really consisting of, which is something that you typically lose if you have Excel in the middle, uh, because then you aggregate everything and you need to tie it back somehow manually to the origination of the costs. But all that transparency is kept within the system, uh, which in turn allows us, and we'll see that in, in a couple of slides down the line, uh, allows us to uh, provide um, reporting on transfer pricing, um, on VAT leakage, indirect tax leakage, um, and where uh, the recipient of the charge is the US, uh, US multinationals, but also US subsidiaries of, uh, of, of other multinationals to give transparency and planning on, on BEAT, uh, which is a specific US tax, it's a penalty on outsourcing um, activities outside of the US. And all that is that is automated. And, and that was the crux because like everyone pretty much on the, on the poll, uh, GE 10 years ago was doing everything that we're describing here uh, by Excel as well. Yeah, if we could go to the next slide. I think this, uh, gives just a little more detail about the kind of uh, flow of data um, and processing that takes place uh, in the system. So this is more in depth about how it actually operates. So you can see that a variety of uh, GL information is actually imported into the system. Um, this is an automated feed or can be automated uh, and that is because when things change, our system needs to automatically adapt. There is possibilities of manually uploading things uh, into our system, um, but we try and automate as much as possible. We then validate that information, um, and then if there's any errors within that process, those errors are handled um, within the system, and our operation team uh, works with the business uh, to fix anything uh, so that processing can continue. So we have uh, monthly uh, billing transactions. These are usually periodic, so we are not running live transactions each day, although the system can schedule uh, transactions to run as frequently as necessary. Um, we have what we call billing runs that uh, operate each month on a regular basis. They're a scheduled billing. 
uh, and we process in um, in batches. Um, and then uh, we also uh, then provide the accounting uh, files. So anything that might require journal entries or feedbacks into the ERP systems. Um, we create, of course, the PDF invoices or memos as such, and then uh, the downstream processing for compliance also occurs. Um, and then we interact with, as we said before, any ancillary systems the businesses might have, um, consolidate, consolidated GL um, systems or settlement applications. Any, I think that's it for the, the processing, Dirk. Yep, and perhaps one additional comment on the PDF invoices, which you see being produced at the uh, in the middle at uh, at the bottom. Um, for countries where there's e-invoicing, um, where the invoicing is controlled by the tax authorities themselves, typically through a portal, um, as as a way for them to control the outgoing invoices, the AR invoices, uh, we have that integration as well. Um, so. You, Think of countries like China and Mexico, and there's more and more countries, Italy, um, that that have that in an attempt to control the uh, the, the invoicing flows. Uh, that integration is right there as uh, as well, uh, which is something that is definitely on the increase, and we we fully expect that over the next few years, more and more countries, even this year, um, will have uh, new countries being added on that um, because of new legislation in those countries. But th this is the future. Um, E-invoicing is uh, is the way to go, where the tax authorities themselves uh, are involved in the actual production of the invoices, and we have the integration, automatic integration for that as well. Um, can you go to the next page, please? Um, what would you see on this page is essentially the three <clears throat> degrees of automation that we have included in, in our system. Um, and top to bottom in the table, um, called regular billing, product billing, and ad hoc billing, um, uh, is the automation of, of billing. The regular billing is by far the most automated billing. You configure it, and then it's touchless for the duration of, um, of that uh, setup. Um, in, in essence, what we create there is not transaction by transaction or transaction set by transaction, but we're defining a billing route. As long as that billing route stays intact, then the billing automatically will be happening and um, costs will be picked up automatically automatically from cost centers for example um, converted into uh, invoices and journal entries and um, uh, the entire process is, is entirely touchless and and um, and automated uh, that is not applicable not possible for all kinds of transactions what you think about is our actual expense-based transactions typically personnel charges for example expat costs uh, an expat would go for a typical period of three to four years. Costs will arise for that expat in multiple countries, um, month by month. The destination of those charges is clear for that entire duration of that um, of that secondment. Um, so clearly, you can just set up that billing route and then fire and forget almost. It's completely touchless for duration of that uh, of that secondment in this example. Um, one level down in terms of automatability is what we call product billing or uh, rate card billing. Um, think, for example, about shared services centers or IT, uh, global IT departments, um, where there's one set of, of activities that is being um, rendered for a multitude of internal customers. Um, and what we do there is before we actually have the billing determine up front. Um, the rate cards, so the price per allocation key, and that that may be um, anything from the number of PCs or the number of um, um, journal entries being made, for example, uh, anything that's collectible. Um, so once that is set, the actual billing um, is automated. The volume collections, which is the allocation keys, are collected automatically, and the price is being applied. Um, and that during the period where it's quarterly or, or yearly, that's totally configurable, um, those billings will happen on that basis. And, and then at the end of the period, again, that can be quarterly, can be monthly, can be uh, annually, uh, a true up or true down is being made 
depending on actual costs and actual allocation keys as, as are being produced. So it's still very automated, uh, but up front, the rate card setting and at the back, um, the true ups and true downs where, where necessary are, in, uh, that involves a little bit more of ad hoc work, but still the bulk of it is, is automated. Um, and the last category is what we call ad hoc billing. Um, can you go back to the prior, yep, thank you. Um, ad hoc billing, which in essence is anything else. Um, typically, um, it, would it would involve manually collected data, uh, for example, on annual bills for sometimes management fees, um, sometimes um, logo fees, so um, uh, royalties for, um, for, for the use of the logo, uh, the company logo, uh, transfer price corrections, anything that's one-off. Management fees um, ideally are not one-off, and that's where the three by three by three model comes in. But in many companies, we're seeing that management fees are, are even today um, still based on, on an annual process. Um, so that can be done as well. And if you look at what is available in the market in terms of, of other solutions for this, it's, it's mostly around that last category, the ad hoc billing, a workflow that is being provided. Um, but the two other categories um, up on top um, is where uh, the automation is really possible. And, and through one bill, we, we, uh, we automate that as, as much as we can. Um, on the next page, just by way of example, um, actual expense-based, if, you, if you've got those four countries, purely by way of example, on the left-hand side, the UK, uh, let's imagine there's a regional um, headquarters there. Um, let's imagine in the US, there is the global headquarters. And in Italy, um, there would be a, a, uh, an operating company. And on top, you have on the right-hand side, you have a shared service center, let's say in India. Um, then by way of example, the, the charges from the, um, the regional to the global H HQ can be on, on actual expense-based basis, uh, which can be completely automated. And those are long-term relationships. No need to um, individually try to uh, do that by, by Excel. You can completely automate that by way of um, um, touchless billing. Uh, the billing down um, to the operating companies can be either ad hoc uh, or automated, as the case may be. And a shared service center's billing to the operating companies in any company around the world um, is, is a typical example of rate card billing. So each of those categories, depending on the company's needs and, and, and capabilities, can be automated to the, to the largest extent possible. And, and the important thing is that even if there's multiple steps in a transaction, that the granularity, so the precision of each single charge and the transparency, what it consists of, um, is maintained throughout the billing chain. And that's all on the back of um, one biller um, processing all those data flows. And so taking it out of the ERPs, processing it and putting it back into the ERPs, that, that provides that transparency, irrespective of ERP make or, or brand. Um, and at the same time, uh, allowing um, very detailed reporting that I'll talk about in a second. Next, next slide, please. Um, I think I mentioned a couple of those characteristics already. It's ERP agnostic, uh, meaning that no matter which ERPs are involved, we still have the same level of transparency and automation. Uh, it's all handled within one biller. So all the technology is part of one biller. Um, we're VAT compliant in, in a large number of countries, um, 100 plus countries where we are applying our, our indirect tax. Um, journal entries automated into the sub ledgers where, where needed and uh, into the general ledgers. Um, they are auto reconciled. And there is very importantly on the reporting, there's granularity and transparency. So when you've done everything, you look back over the period that you've been doing those transactions in, uh, you, you can analyze to a very low level where needed what you have done and where the issues might be, which allows you at the end of the day to uh, correct and, uh, and adjust. Um, next, next slide, please. Just a couple of examples on that, on the reporting. This is a, a transfer pricing analysis. On the left upper hand side, you see a table with Every line is one transaction, and 
literally um, for one of our customers, we have more than 380,000 transactions per year. And each line here represents one transaction. So that's clearly way too much information right there. Going one step below on the left lower hand side, those are summarized per legal entity. Each go there in the first column in that second table is, is a legal entity. And you're seeing there, well, how much was net charged in total? How much was the transfer price and revenue? And you're seeing there that the profitability of that entity by way of example here is, is 0.15%. Most analyses would stop at that level and say, oops, that's not a lot. We need to correct that. But if you then dig down into each of those, into that entity and look at the individual transactions, um, you will see on the right um, hand side that a big chunk of the transactions going through that entity was actually a disbursement of costs. In other words, just a pass through of costs for uh, 100 million here, which in a transfer pricing methodology would attract no markup. So uh, what initially looked like something that was too low, once you see the details, um, service by service that went through that entity, you realize that a big chunk of that um, pass of that cost charge was actually a pass through that should have attracted no markup, and it didn't. But that in turn had an, an, a, a large effect on the average markup. Um, so that level of detail, service by service, markup by markup, you can actually see by drilling down into the into the entities, and that's all on the back of the data structure that we have um, based on service types. Um, when you look at ERPs, um, they have SKUs for products, they have bills and materials for products, but not so for um, services. So in a way, the service types that we're using, the service categories are your SKUs, and uh, the details that we'll show in a second uh, are the bills and material for each, uh, for each service, which are completely different one day to the next, one organization to the next. So nothing standardized there that, that you would expect to see on products. Uh, but still, it gives a similar functionality as SKUs and, and bills of material in many ways. Next page, please. I'll uh, I'll, I'll explain here. Um, question here on the, on, on the poll is pretty self-explanatory. Question on how many tax audits are, are pending in your organization. Uh, specifically with respect to intercompany service charges at, at this uh, at this moment. Derek, uh, what what do you see in in terms of um, audits? Uh, it, it, uh, are, are we expecting tax authorities to be more critical on these service charges? Abs uh, absolutely. In the coming, yeah, coming time, is, is that? Yep because they need money or just in general they need they're also expecting more traceability of of services i think it's a combination of the two um the, the um service charges are right now a, a low-hanging fruit as far as tax authorities are concerned because they know it will be hard for um taxpayers to explain what the charges are for, why they are that magnitude, what they consist of. Um, so it's an easy target for tax authorities around the world. And we very often see that um, non-deductibility goes up to 50, 60% of the charges made, um, especially if it's generic service, uh, service categories like management fees as a category, as opposed to the breakdown into legal services, financial services, et cetera. Um, where, where you cannot do that, tax authorities would routinely um, try to uh, to deny the deductibility. We see that uh, happening a lot. So half of the audience says we have one audit running. Mm -hmm. uh, there's 25% uh, with three and 25% and, and with four. I would say that sort of reflects uh, what you just indicated, uh, Derek. Yep, I'm not, I'm not surprised. Obviously, it's a function of how many entities there are. Um, but yeah, that, that doesn't surprise me at all. So the, the impact uh, is measured in uh, different ways. Uh, I think uh, you, you can look at the non-deductible part times the tax rate. Uh, you can also see that um, non-deductibility 
um, while you have paid it uh, comes uh, with uh, secondary adjustments like withholding taxes uh, and uh, penalties and interest charges alongside with it. Uh, I guess, uh, but that's a question to you, Derek and Laura. Uh, you, you would also see here the potential impact of VAT uh, and VAT treatment uh, as a potential leakage for those yes. charges being accepted or not. Uh, right. Uh, if you get, uh, if you're in Italy, you get charged a million a year. Um, how how would that work from a VAT perspective? Uh, would that uh, make make a bit, huge difference in terms of uh, cash out? It, just... it depends. Yeah, it, it you know as, as as so often depends on the status of the Italian recipient, whether it it's um, it's a, a, a net export or not, for example. It will depend on your, the industry you're in. Um, yeah. If it's financial services, you have a different category um, because you cannot recoup your VAT uh, typically. Um, and it depends on, on the cross-border nature of your charges, whether it's within country or, or cross-border, uh, which are all determinant factors. Um, so yeah, definitely it, it, it makes a big difference. There's at least one third of the audience with, which says 10 million is at stake. That's quite a lot, to be honest. I wasn't expecting that. Uh, another one third between 1 million and 10, and, and about one third, it's, um, it's marginal. And, and it depends a little bit on the size of your business, of course, but less than 100 euros at stake uh, still might be big if it's just one audit. Uh, surprised uh, Derek and Laura on, uh, on these numbers? Yeah, the 10 million, more than 10 million is, is large, um, but obviously depends on, on if, if that's uh, more than four audits and comprising multiple uh, intercompany services, then it can add up very quickly. Um, but it is, it's a large amount of money for sure. Yeah, it almost, uh, if, I, if I reflect on that, it almost means you, you need to have uh, a, a probably between 50 and 100 million of the headquarters uh, with four countries being less receptive on the charges they get and uh, start uh, pushing you back to get to up to 10 million. So we're right. looking at, at big numbers here. Indeed. Okay. Yeah. Let's go yeah, ahead and let's continue. Uh, uh, and perhaps one, one comment. Um, we tend to think of services like groups of people working together in management fees, and et cetera, but it could also be cost recharges that finance teams would not necessarily regard as a service, but tax authorities do. Um, so that may be a, a driver here as well, where there's, where there's significant cost recharges. Um, in, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll keep this short. Um, I think I mentioned a couple of times before the transparency. Uh, what you see on the left-hand side is a typical tax invoice that we're producing uh, with, very, uh, with various components of data on there. Um, what you see in the middle um, category, in the middle table on the right-hand side, is the line by line cost details of that initial of that charge so you see a total charge being made on the tax invoice and on the right hand side in the middle you're seeing okay what cost components do, do that does that exist uh, consists of if you think for example um, i mentioned expats before if you make one charge for that um of of, um, of 100 thousand um then this would enable you to say okay well 100 thousand um, 40,000 is, is salaries, um, 20,000 is wage tax, uh, 10,000 is schooling costs for the kids, um, 5,000 is removal cost of the furniture, et cetera, et cetera. So it gives you line by line transparency, um, which is critical towards the tax authorities that you can explain that to, that to them. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned BEAT before, um, a very US specific tax. Um, it's it's a in essence a penalty on outsourcing activities from the US to else, elsewhere, and the penalty kicks in on the recharge that is being made of those costs back into the US. Um, the um, the amounts can be large. It's it's an increasing penalty year over year. The amounts uh, the the rates are being increased. Um, what there are certain ex exemptions, but those exemptions are based on the nature of the charge that's being made, the markup that is being made, and the status of the entities between which the, the charges are made. 
um, and what we're showing on this page is the green hairs are charges from actual branches, meaning branches from a foreign entity back to the US. Those, those are exempted um, in principle. Um, so if you're able to identify that um, in, your, in your data, then you can exclude those right away. The same for what we call check the box. So this is the, the status of, of foreign legal entities that are receiving a certain uh, category, categorization in, in US tax law. Um, and there's, there's these exemptions in yellow on, the, uh, on specific services. Um, we have seen that up to 80% of what you ordinarily would regard as beatable charges, you can get away from, depending on, on your cir circumstance of the entity. Um, but if you're not able to identify those exemption categories, uh, if you're not able to identify charge by charge that's between branches or from check the box entities, or regarding certain transactions that are uh, subject to the SEM uh, exemption, for example, because the rate, the markup rate may be too high, um, th then you have no choice but to report everything as beatable. Um, so it's it's just a, a category of transfer pricing documentation, if you like, that can be very substantial uh, uh, if if you have the data ready. Um, and the data points are right here on this page. Um, so those data are being kept. Um, in, in the system. So we're enriching the data to allow the beat analysis being made. Um, so the SCM nature, the markup uh, being charged, the branch status, etc. People interested to uh, uh, join and uh, communicate with uh, the presenters of today. We have another uh, uh, of the Building Blocks for Tax webinar series coming up in uh, two weeks from now uh, on transfer pricing. Uh, types of software with connectors to your uh, source system. Um, so uh, another uh, uh, possibility to, to get exposed to another uh, Lego for tax building block. Uh, thanks very much for joining today. A special thanks to Derek and Laura for, uh, for, for the, their presentation. Very interesting. Uh, very uh, appealing for corporates to take it to the next stage. Uh, so much appreciated and I'd like to see you all back on, on our next webinar. Enjoy Thank your day. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.